We've got a big new poll with lots of new data. This time on Poll Hub, we're digging in and exploring what Americans are telling us about the race for the White House and all the issues surrounding it. Then if you're a student of political polls, you probably have RCP, Real Clear Politics, bookmark. But that famous RCP average is under fire and we'll explain why it might just be justified. So let's get to it. And hi, everybody. Welcome to Poll Hub. I'm J.D. Dapper, Director of Innovation here at the Marist Poll. And I'm Lee Marengoff, Director of the Marist College Institute for Public Opinion. And I'm Barbara Carvalho, Director of the Marist Poll. And before we get to the big poll that we teased, which was our poll with NPR and PBS NewsHour, which was big. I mean, uh, tons of questions, tons of issues. There's a lot to dig into. But something happened um, this week. What? Um, uh, oh, Kamala Harris. That's it. Yeah. Vice president, uh, vice presidents don't always, don't generally, it's widely con considered, don't make a big difference, the pick. Does this make a big difference? Is there any indication that this is like the best thing that Joe Biden's ever done or doesn't make, you know, any difference to the race? What do you think? Well, there, there's two totally different schools of thought on this, as there often is in politics. One, this was the safe pick. Two, this was the historic pick. So you're either- It could be both. You know. It could be, I guess. Uh, she was well vetted, Kamala Harris, and uh, yet it also created a certain energy, I think, that the ticket was perhaps lacking. Uh, I'm not sure how much enthusiasm matters in this day and age when you're running against an unpopular incumbent, but to the degree that the Biden team wanted to create a generally seen as a positive move on the part of, on the part of most, I think Kamala Harris fit the bill. I think in both instances, I mean, even if you kind of harken back to 2016, I think when um, President Trump uh, picked um, Pence last time, I think that that was also, you know, a, a good pick for his base. Um, that was kind of shoring up evangelical Christians who did have some question about uh, the president's uh, or the uh, Trump's um, the candidate at the time, um, his character and the issues uh, that were the characteristic issues that were certainly um, being, you know, front and center in the campaign. I think in this instance, uh, there's a there, there's a question that both of these uh, candidates, both President Trump and Joe Biden, are certainly older Americans. We don't want to think of them as you know, uh, having already one foot in the grave, but that becomes the discussion as to if, if and when something should happen, can the person that they have picked step into that role? Um, going forward right now, certainly Pence has been given a lot of responsibility by the White House. Uh, so that is certainly a transition that many Americans uh, don't have difficulty with, at least picturing him in that role. And I think Biden pretty much had the you know, this, the same concern that uh, who will now be the next standard bearer for the Democratic Party? Um, he promised that it would be um, a woman. I think that Kamala was, of, I'm not so sure, a safe choice. I don't quite understand the safety uh, portion of that. Um, but certainly uh, she was someone who had been on the national scene uh, had had a presidential campaign herself. I think it's really important for the Democrats to probably not have picked someone who was the head of a state or a city or was some kind of an executive because there's no way of telling what may have happened in one of those communities that that vice president would have had to justify um, in the coming months or would be taken away to have to deal with. Yeah. So I think a sitting senator, it's not unusual that senators are often picked as vice presidential uh, running mates. And um, I think in this particular instance, um, it was certainly an, an important fact. Yeah, we're gonna to turn to our latest poll data very quickly, but you, should, you said vice presidents are often picked from the Senate. Democrats haven't picked anybody but a senator with one exception since the 1940s. So it certainly is a very common Kamala pick there. There are gonna be a lot of polls out soon yeah. um, that, that are going to reflect this, this new ticket. Mm -hmm. uh, the one we have out right now was done pretty much all before the pick. Uh, Want to 
play with some of the results, Lee? Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, you know, what this poll, as always, is our live interviewer talking to folks on uh, on uh, landline and cell phones, which is going to become an important part of the discussion coming up. Uh, but right now we're seeing uh, Joe Biden with an 11 point lead, actually quite similar to the numbers that Monmouth was showing uh, a couple of days ago. Um, and uh, we're seeing a good number for him uh, in the suburbs uh, around the nation, uh, doing unusually well for Democrat among white voters. Uh, women, it's not surprising because that's where the gender gap has been very pronounced and we see that again. Um, and I think that, you know, for Joe Biden, as I look in the numbers, we see a very close difference between him and or a narrowing of the difference between uh, Biden and Trump on who would better handle the economy. That's been the weakness potentially for Joe Biden on the coronavirus, on race relations. He's been way, way in front. Uh, but there was concern in the Biden camp that maybe the economy was going to be some vulnerability. And I think just in terms of this poll, again, not including the vice presidential nominee uh, pick uh, on the part of uh, Biden, that we're going to see that uh, there. Mr. DeDapper, I, I was going to ask you. Yeah, well, what stood out for you, Jay? Um, the, there actually hasn't been a lot of change. The, the, this is, if, the, if anything, this is a continuation of what we've been seeing for three years, which is a kind of historic unpopularity of the president, who hasn't been able to move that a lot in either direction. It, it's moving in the wrong direction. The movement that's happening is moving in the wrong direction for Donald Trump, to be sure, but it's slight, you know? And I, everything that's happened since the beginning of the coronavirus uh, pandemic and, uh, and and the beginning of this decline in his numbers that we have seen, which has not been huge, but it has happened, uh, it, it just continues. And, and there doesn't seem to be anything that is being done uh, at the White House anyway to staunch that bleeding. Um, there's definitely a floor. I mean, it's clearly not going to go below some number and it's not falling fast, but you don't want to be falling and you don't want to be getting 10 or 11 points down from your opponent as the incumbent three months before election day, you'd like to be closing that gap. And there's nothing in this poll. There's nothing that indicates there's a closing. Well, I thought, was, I thought what was striking was, we, was the double digit lead by Biden in this poll, which also had a difference of only two points between Democrats and Republicans in, in terms of people identifying with each party. I think in the past we have seen uh, polls with a wide Biden lead, but also with uh, people identifying more with the Democratic Party. This time in this poll, the, uh, the most popular party was independent, uh, no, neither party. Um, and so we had the plurality of Americans uh, identifying themselves in, in that way. So I, I thought that was I thought that was particularly striking. And that um, is that trend that we talked about, remember, on this show, what, three or four weeks ago. And that is a trend that is continuing. And, and it speaks, I think, to people not loving politics in general. In fact, hating, we had a focus group recently, remember, and, and everybody hated politics. Republicans, mm -hmm. Democrats, independents, they hated politics. And when everybody hates politics, you raise your hand and go, you know, I'm not associated with either one of those parties. Yeah. And, I think and, and, and Joe Biden is winning 52 to 36, 16 points among those independent identifiers. So if they're a growing group and a more important group in the electorate, that's the group you want to be rolling up the score on. The other, that's exactly what he's doing. The other thing that relates to Kamala Harris here is that we continue to see um, suburban women uh, with this dramatic move uh, away from, and I, I say it not towards Biden, because I do think that it's really away from, from Donald Trump and Kamala Harris as a woman. And then the, the lack of African-American turnout in 2016 as compared to 2012 and 2008, and whether that comes back in 2020, and you know, we see that's hard to pick up in the numbers, right? That, that's hard to see in a poll whether they're gonna turn out or not. But the, that constituency of the Democratic Party has to turn out and she's an African-American. So yeah, and I in, think fact, that, in I, fact, that's a good point. Half of uh, Biden supporters actually say that they are voting against Trump and not for Biden. So that is certainly the motivating factor uh, for many, many people. Uh, you also, though, Jay, mentioned that there 
there's a lot, a lot of stuff in this poll. We asked about the, um, the pandemic um, and people's reactions to that, who would best handle that. Um, Joe Biden um, outpaces uh, Trump on uh, being able to handle uh, the, the pandemic, race relations. Uh, they're actually now practically tied um, on the economy. Uh, so that, that was also um, a pretty significant significant change. The, the other thing though too is we, we asked some kind of uh, questions about institutions and what people, where people think that they're getting trusted information um, about the virus. And that was kind of unnerving because each of you had asked this question back in March um, and um, we have seen some slippage Although people still, 75% of Americans, still look to health experts, we've seen the debate about what the facts are and where the facts come from has had an impact. That was 85%, um, or sorry, 84% um, in, in March. Other declines have been state and local government um, and also with the, with the president and the, and the yeah. media. Yeah, but before we move on, I just want to point out one other quick debate that we're getting uh, that's getting a lot of attention that we asked about on this is whether people plan on voting by the mail or whether they plan on voting in person. And Joe Biden's supporters, surprise, surprise, 62% say they're planning on voting before election day in, in the mail, by mail. Only 36 say in person. Donald Trump is not only the opposite, it's even more so, 24% saying they're going to vote by mail, 72% say they're going to vote for in person. So when you're hearing about this debate going on, think about where people are getting their support from, because that's uh, one and the same. And so, you know, we are among, um, we're one of many um, public polls uh, that are tracking the presidential campaign. And uh, we will be added to the real clear politics average that uh, many poll watchers follow. Um, as uh, Jay, you mentioned, you know, RCP is something that has been cut that that has been uh, tracking and averaging polls now for for several cycles, and has actually been uh, they were kind of in the forefront before we had uh, all of these forecasters, but they got into a rather significant controversy uh, among the forecasters in this past week. Uh, Lee, do you want to tell us what that was all about? Well, you know, a lot of people, as you say, depend on real care politics. And I know we look at it periodically. Uh, we also look at 538, uh, Nate Silver's uh, organization, who also do an average. And theirs is done very differently. The issue that pollsters are taking with the real care tallies is that it's unclear who makes the makes is included, who isn't. How long do you stay in the average? You mean the polls the, themselves? Yes, the polls themselves. And then also, it's somewhat dependent upon the whim and scheduling of the polls. So if you have polls more and more of varying quality, or I should say of questionable quality, and if you have a run of those, as we just did, where they were down to four, five, six points in the difference, it pulled the average down to six and a half percent roughly. It's now back up a little bit because of some high quality polls that have been added to the numbers. And now it's up around seven and a half, I guess. Uh, but it seems very much a product of timing of the pollsters when they happen to do their polls and what kind of quality polls those are. That does not help you if you're interested in finding out, well, what is the average really all about? Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's a need to understand what's included, how long they're included, how long they stay in the average. Lots of things that we're not knowing about the real clear average yet, it's still very much considered kind of like, what do we do with all these polls? Add them all up and divide them by the number, and that's the average. And that may be very limiting in, uh, in, in a, a, as an exercise. Well, this isn't the first time RCPs come in under controversy. Um, last time, I think they also came under controversy for highlighting uh, what was considered more Republican polls. The time before that, in 2012, um, some of the campaigns and interest groups and lobby groups and PACs were actually uh, sponsoring their own polls so that they could affect the real clear uh, politics average. So this isn't exactly new news. But, it, but it's, well, much, it's getting more controversial because of the 
growing number of polls and the decreasing quality. Mr. Didapa, Jay, you, you're, you're trying to get in. in. <laughs> I am. Yeah, a, this is a tough crowd today. You guys are <laughs> extra cups of I don't know. I mean, you know, yeah, I had, a, I had my caffeinated tea today. I guess Woo. I'm a little chatty. <laughs> so RCP is something that, as a political reporter, I used. Uh, this goes back more than several cycles. I mean, RCP was around in the early 2000s. And um, I think there's two things about um, the averagers and aggregators that I'd say. One is we've done a case study in the academy on this and it's worth mm -hmm. watching. It's only two and a half minutes long, but it does point out and we lay it out on the line that averages are helpful. They're useful to the extent that you know what goes into the averages mm -hmm. and aggregators are something entirely different. So we're just talking about averages. There's two big ones, RCP and Nate Cohn's 538. Neither one of them is totally transparent with how they figure it out. Nate says that he does a lot more stuff in, in terms of rating poster quality. We like that, we're an A plus poll, right? We'd like to be you know, higher rated and get more weighting within that average. But the fact is that the averages, you don't know exactly who gets in and how it's calculated. So as a reporter, you know, or as a poll consumer, everybody should look at that with a giant grain of salt and say, well, that's interesting and draw no more conclusions from it than that. Oh, that's interesting. Although I may <laughs> add just one thing. I'd like to add just one thing. If we if we hearken back to 2016, uh, we had some issues with forecasters uh, and the probability that they said a certain candidate was going to win. That's some as high as 98% and 538, I believe, is at 77%. 71, 71. Those are, but those are, those are the predictors, the forecasting model, which we, again, we cover in that case study. We're talking about the averages and the aggregators. Exactly. The forecasters, Absolutely. that's a whole nother, that's like, you know, you might as well go yeah, to the Hang on a second, hang on a second. If you were following, if you were following the real clear politics average, four years ago, you had a much better sense of what the election and what the turnout was going to be than any of the other um, aggregating um, and forecasting. Yeah, and, and, and right now, to give, and to give Nate uh, credit where credit's due, right now we're showing a 53 to 42 percentage point uh, for Biden, uh, 11. They're showing at 538, 51 to 42. So we're actually kind of right in touch with that, uh, wider than what we would consider some called a phantom swing that was seen in the, um, in the uh, real clear numbers because of the issues we've been talking about. But there's also a topic we've been talking about quite a bit and on and off, and that is the census, which is important uh, to pollsters for important reasons and also to things like federal funds that get allocated. And, and Barb, I know you've weighed in on this and now there's more developments uh, that are troublesome in, in, in the area of counting the people that exist in America today. So well, yes, tell, tell me why only, you're worried. It's not only a tradition, but it's also mandated by our constitution that we have a full count of people, um, not citizens, not residents, but people um, in the country every 10 years. And we've spoken about how this is certainly important for all researchers, for pollsters, it gives us an, a, a sense of what the population, what the actual number of the population is overall, as well as the subgroups and, and all the diversity that uh, is America and allows us to balance our surveys. We've, we've heard a lot about balancing surveys for education and for, for um, you know, people of color or for a lot of other uh, different um, uh, variables. But what's important is we can only balance to numbers that we know actually exist when someone actually went out and counted them. And that's what the census does every 10 years for, for us, as well as for the country. As you mentioned, Lee, the census is incredibly important for redistricting. It's for representation, uh, Congress, uh, congressional seats, um, around the country. It's very important for allocating uh, the billions of dollars uh, of federal dollars um, that go to states and local uh, um, communities around the country. So this is, this is a very important process. And 2020 has been very difficult. It's been very a politicized. Strange, yeah. uh, and very difficult year. 
um, even aside from all the politics that has surrounded the census. To do a census uh, in, the, in the midst of a pandemic was certainly nothing that they had planned for. They had planned for almost everything else, uh, natural disasters, um, all sorts of all sorts of things, but a pandemic was was not on the list. So, Barb, it sounds to me that the last thing you'd want to do right now is end the census count early, which is exactly what the Trump administration is proposing. Well, like many things, like many things, the census has also become very politicized. And when you're counting people, um, you're counting. Uh, people from all walks of life, from all geographies. You're also counting people who are immigrants, people who may be here uh, who are undocumented. And that goes, that all goes into the assessment of you know, how many seats uh, a state gets in Congress. It gets, uh, it gets directly to the, uh, um, the idea of how much money that state or that community mm -hmm. is, is going yeah. to get. And the electoral so college whenever you're itself. divvying up yeah. power and dollars, it becomes very political. Yeah. So from the Trump administration uh, wanting to put a, um, a citizenship question on the census and actually holding back um, the questionnaire uh, instrument, at the very beginning, to cutting the uh, the time that the census takers have to be able not only to do the census, so to be able to go door to door, but also to deliver that information uh, to the president, which he and his administration wants to be done December 31st, as opposed to the extended date of April 21st, which would then put that on the desk of the next president. Uh, Jay, do you have any final words on counting the census that you might want to share with us? We, we have dominated census talk. I don't know if this is a topic near and dear to your heart. I mean, look, the, the thing about the census is that like almost every other institution that we used to have faith in, this has been mm -hmm. beaten up. And the, my biggest concern is that you get to the other side of the census, census comes out and nobody believes it. That really hasn't happened. You know, lots of well, industries, I mean, we're not the only one that depend on the census absolutely. count. There's a lot of industries, there's a lot of government programs. There's, I mean, the whole country, the whole economy in many ways depends on an accurate census. If, you, if the census becomes like the media and the courts and, the, and everybody right now, like the military, I guess, is about the last of the, the, the ones, that, the institutions that get high marks among people. If, if it goes the way, that way, I, that I think there's a very, very serious risk to the, the way we live, you know, to the economy and to the way that we govern ourselves. And that's the, to, to me, that's the biggest concern of all. It's just one more institution that yeah. is derided and torn apart and politicized. And what's left is nobody believes it. And I think that yeah. would be a real shame. Yeah, no, that's, that's really very, very, very there true. Is, there, is, there is one fallback. It has never been used but it is possible to do a census within five years um, if there is a feeling that there is, uh, th that the 10 year census was, was not an accurate count. That might yeah, be the uh, Kamala Harris census. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and, and I, would, I would just jump in because I always look to the census changing, changes in population as, you know, things that will change the electoral college in the next presidential election, not only the redistricting in Congress, and so uh, inaccurate count then also distorts those numbers. So there's nothing good to be said other than a lot of people are doing a lot of hard work to try to get this right. And now it's being difficult. And I know we've mentioned, we've mentioned the focus on, on immigrants, but remember some of the hardest places to, to reach people are rural communities. And they will, they will suffer terribly in terms of dollars that go to hospitals uh, and infrastructure and other uh, support services. And they're, and they're disproportionately Republican to play the, the politics of this. They're disproportionately Republican. So it's just, it just doesn't help anybody. It just doesn't help yeah. anybody to, 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 you know, futz with this. So, anyway. Yeah. Is that the last word, Mr. Dadat, for today? Sure. Don't futz with it. <laughs> Don't futz with it. <laughs> well, that's a, that could go up on a billboard, the Maris poll. Do not futz with this. Who wants to say that does it for the Maris poll? Uh, and now uh, this is a production of uh, Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. And if anybody wants to thank Mary Griffith, our executive producer, Casey Schaff, our editor, and Amelia Morrell, our production assistant, 
and Hudson, of course, the growing canine. Well, I think you, I think you did that very well, Lee. Oh, oh, I guess I will do that then. Okay, I've done that. You can okay, move. great. And thanks to the Roper Center Archive at Cornell University. Uh, we love to always give you guys a shout out because you're the way that we are able to uh, see survey questions and results over the decades and be able to compare uh, how uh, Americans and uh, people even in other places around the world uh, think now and have in the past. If you've got questions, reach out to us on social media. We're at Maris Pollen, Facebook, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I don't know where that came from. You you don't weren't thinking of MySpace, were you? Yeah. Were you actually hearkening back, Jay? Uh, Friendster, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amelia, who oh, our, our production go. assistant, is looking at us like, what are they talking about? Is that Egyptian? What are those things? Anyway. Uh, also, we mentioned the Academy and a couple of things we talked about on this show today are covered in the Academy. Worth your while. It's free. It's an online education course. Uh, and uh, check it out. It's easy to find in our show notes. And finally, if you like what you hear on Poll Hub, uh, consider leaving a review. It's the easiest way to help other people find us. So if you like us and you want other people to be listening, that's a great way to do it. Positive reviews are always very helpful. And while you're at it, go ahead and subscribe. In the meantime, the pandemic is still with us, folks. Summer is dragging on. Just keep staying safe.